and the policy related uh, issues that can combat the growing rates of overweight and obesity. And I've had good fortune of uh, working with Catherine. Catherine has, has been my online friend for last one and a half years. This is the first time we are meeting each other offline. And exactly last March uh, 4th, when we launched the Let's Fix Our Food e-dialogues, uh, uh, I mean, now after one full year, we have Catherine here, uh, who's our consortium partner uh, in the Let's Fix Our Food initiative. Uh, she's here to deliver a talk and also Oliver, uh, who's working in this area and is just about to submit his uh, dissertation in a week's time, uh, is going to uh, speak about his research work. And um, uh, as you all know, in the context of growing overweight obesity and non-communicable diseases in the uh, low and middle income countries, there is an important and urgent need to look at various actions which can actually uh, bring the uh, uh, elephant in the room under control. Otherwise, we are um, probably will we'll walk the same way as the most developed countries did uh, in the past. And uh, given this background, uh, uh, Professor uh, Catherine and Oliver today, they share one talk. And the talk is broadly, uh, it's, it's, it's about challenges and opportunities for policy action to improve population diets globally, but they have reformulated the talk's title in a, in a short and easy to understand uh, way. It's called Enhancing Policies to Improve Global Population Diets, and we expect their global research, especially in the Southeast Asian context, they have lots of uh, information, ideas, and data to tell us and uh, some lessons uh, to learn. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, Catherine Backholler is a professor and co-director of the Global Center for Preventive Health and Nutrition at Deakin University. Her work um, is uh, solutions focused with the aim to inform policy and practice of the most effective ways to improve population diets and nutrition, and also to reduce social inequalities in health. Catherine is particularly interested uh, in the intersections of equity and the commercial determinants of health and application of interdisciplinary solutions to complex public health problems, especially, I mean, her research has looked at uh, advertising and marketing of unhealthy foods and also taxing taxation of unhealthy foods to um, uh, restrict their consumption in many um, contexts. And fortunately for us, Catherine has been associated with the Let's Fix Our Food initiative. And then she's been very instrumental in helping us identify right experts uh, for the webinar series. Um, uh, we've um, done some couple of publications uh, uh, together. I'm happy that they've invited us to be part of one of the commentaries recently published during the World Children's Day in November in The Lancet on why children need to have a stake in policy landscape of uh, food environments. And uh, I've, I've had the good fortune of co-authoring that with them. And now uh, in, a, in a publication related to policy, um, Public Health Foundation of India has looked at various marketing and uh, uh, advertising policies in India about uh, food. And uh, that's one paper under consideration. And then again, we've co-authored that together. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for taking time out to visit Hyderabad especially to enhance the collaboration and interact with some of our scientists working in this area and to uh, present uh, your findings in terms of a talk. I'm also happy to inform you that the National Heart, uh, she's the National Heart Foundation Future Leader Fellow, and she's also a fellow of the Public Health Association of Australia, and she's the Vice President of Public Health Foundation for Public Health Association of Australia. And introducing our next speaker, Oliver Hughes, He's a PhD student at the Deakin University's Global Center for Preventive Health and Nutrition, which in short is called GLOBE in Victoria, Australia. His PhD thesis, rightly so for this uh, day's um, topic, deals with the commercial determinants of unhealthy diets in low and middle income countries in East Asia. And uh, he's interested in exploring uh, processed food and beverage operations influence over food and nutrition environments in this region especially. And, uh, 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 and the potential policy responses that can be taken up to reduce the power of the industry actors on our food environment. Oliver has also worked as a consultant earlier on childhood overweight and obesity for UNICEF in South Asia, 
and uh, south and all south and east africa and also in east asia and the pacific we are uh, very proud to have you here and uh, we've had a good interaction with our director in the morning i hope she'll join very soon she's a bit busy and then asked us to start the uh, uh, seminar today and then i welcome catherine first onto the dais and give her a big round of applause Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sibere. Um, it's a real honour to be here, especially in person. As Dr. Sibere has said, we've um, chatted many times online, but to be here is, is really special. So thank you for having us today. Um, so the way we'll present is I'll start the presentation and then I'll hand to Ollie and um, I'll come back to some of the work that, that I'm doing um, at the end. Um, so just to, I just want to talk first a little bit about our centre. So whether, as Dr. Subaraya said, we're the Global Centre for Preventive Health and Nutrition, um, and we're quite a lot. We're, we sit within the Institute for Health Transformation. There's about seventy of us there, really focused on population health prevention with a main focus and um, a speciality in the area of nutrition. And really, we conduct research. Um, around how do we um, create populations that are, that are enabled by healthy environments. We advocate for evidence-based preventive policy, and we're also really interested in strengthening communities, professionals and academics um, on the science policy and practice of prevention um, and nutrition right across the life course. So, I mean, really, we're not so interested in doing research for research sake, but really to make a difference and to inform policy and practice um, so this is just taken from our website here, and that's um, a picture of my daughter that somehow made it onto the web page um, there. Um, so in Globe, we we work across many different areas. So um, corporate determinants of health, how corporations shape our health, environmental sustainability, um, equity is a really key area of what we do. So if we want to improve nutrition, how do we do that for everyone in society? food environments, global health, and um, we have a really strong health economics team, um, implementation science. So if we have evidence-based policy and programs, how do we make sure we strengthen them and how do we consider the different social, political, cultural contexts uh, to strengthen those initiatives? Monitoring, evaluation, obesity prevention, system science, so how do we consider the whole system rather than siloed um, interventions? Got a real focus on our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, our First Nations people in Australia, um, and community health as well. So um, really today we'll talk about the rapid rise in obesity across the globe um, and some work that we've been doing in South Asia and the persistence of undernutrition, anemia and stunting as well, and the decline in the quality of population diets across the world. Um, touch briefly on you know, the, the evidence-based policies that we already do have in um, across the world, but you know this really key barrier to action, which is the corporate sector, the large transnational food and beverage corporations, the need for double duty actions to address obesity, underweight, um, stunting, anemia, all all at once. Um, and then we'll, at the very end, I'll take a deep dive into an area that I spend a lot of my time studying, and that is on food marketing controls to really denormalize unhealthy food um, in society. So before I start, I'd just like to make an acknowledgement of um, all our different funders. I'm funded by the National Heart Foundation, um, but we are a WHO collaborating centre for the prevention of obesity, um, and we also do a lot of work with UNICEF as well. And then this is my excellent team at Deakin University. I've turned them all into superheroes here um, because they are um, they do you know so much of the great work that I'll be presenting today. So uh, I mean I don't need to tell an uh, institute that's really focused on nutrition that we have a global uh, problem with overweight and obesity, which leads to many uh, cons health consequences. So diabetes, heart disease, cancers, twelve different cancers, mental health outcomes. So a real problem. And if we don't do something to stem this rising um, global epidemic, then we're, we're going to face these huge unsustainable healthcare costs on our healthcare system. So governments, you know, really need to start taking notice of this because it's, it's going to be economically unsustainable with nothing else. And we have many different global commitments from the WHO, many um, other UN agencies such as, um, you know, the FAO, UNICEF, World Food Programme, 
with many different um, recommendations of what we need to do to tackle um, the global rise of obesity. But I think what's most important is that no single solution will be able to reverse the increasing um, rates of obesity. So there's good recognition that we need to take a systems approach to our prevention efforts. So we need you know, individuals to change their behaviour and we need to support individuals with communication and, and information. We need to work with food producers to you know, reformulate to lower salt, fat, sugar uh, products and change the demand um, for healthy and unhealthy foods. We need to work with retailers to change what they offer. Um, schools, you know, changing the standards of which uh, schools have their school meals and um, the nutrition environments that are uh, the food environments that children go to school um, in every day. And then governments also play a role. And this is an area that we do a lot of working around, you know, restricting junk food marketing to children, changing the relative affordability of food so that healthy foods are more affordable and more accessible as well. And so across the world, we have many different um, policies that have actually been implemented. And I'm talking here more around um, the government-led policies. So over 50 countries now have implemented a tax on sugary drinks. And we, we do have good evidence now that it is leading to a reduction in the purchase of sugary drinks. Um, we've got a number of countries that have, have implemented these um, warning labels or, you know, different different food labelling, front of pack food labelling um, systems. This um, one up here, it comes from uh, Mexico. Um, Chile also has a similar warning sign on unhealthy products um, that are high in risk or nutrients of concern. And again, evidence showing that it's working. And then we've got many great examples within schools and in um, the procurement of healthy foods within, uh, say, government settings that are also showing really positive um, impacts. But I think in low middle income countries, and we were talking about this with several of you earlier over lunch, is that we also need to consider the informal food market as well. So, you know, a lot of what we will talk about today will be these big, you know, the big policies that I've mentioned to address uh, transnational corporations, but none of these address the informal uh, food market, which is a huge uh, driver of food choice in these countries as well. And, um, you know, I think that's where governments can also play a role through certain subsidies and, um, you know, ensuring access to certain, you know, healthier oils and healthier foods as well to food vendors. But definitely less, um, these are less prominent in some of these big UN documents, and I think they could be more prominent. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about a piece of work we've been doing with UNICEF uh, at the Regional Office for South Asia. It's called Nourishing South Asia, and it really is a collaboration between um, many different partners across South Asia. We're just doing one small part, and we'll, we'll present that part today. Um, and it's it's really spearheaded by Vani Sethi at um, UNICEF in, in the Kathmandu office. And so the, the questions that we're really inputting on is um, what is the current state of play in terms of obesity and adolescence in South Asia and what actions are needed? So this is using a UNICEF formal landscape analysis, which um, I'll pass to Ollie to explain a bit more um, to in a sec, but really focusing on Bhutan, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and then we're not doing the data collection for India um, that has been done by others, which um, which is which really um, we're synthesising with those other countries to get that regional perspective. We're looking at how do adolescents in South Asia perceive food environments and what needs to change, doing a big survey across um, these countries. And then what are the lived experiences of adolescent girls' experiences with food and food environments? So understanding, you know, their daily lives and how they, how they access their food, what influence food choices, and therefore what are the leverage points for intervention? So I will hand over to Ollie, who will um, present the middle part of the talk, and then I'll come back um, at the end. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine, and thank you all for having me here today to have a talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing in the region. So as Catherine mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about this landscape analysis approach that's been developed by UNICEF. 
And when we talk about the landscape analysis, this is a standardized global tool that UNICEF developed to really respond to a perceived need for a tool that could relatively quickly and with a relatively low resource inten intensivity, identify what was happening in terms of childhood overweight and obesity in a country. And it's really a five-stage process, with the first of these being using a desk review process, so collecting no primary data, but looking at secondary data, identify what was happening in terms of both the trends and the prevalence in childhood overweight and obesity for both young children and infants aged less than five years, and then for children and adolescents aged five to 19 years look at the drivers of overweight and obesity, um, then conduct a policy audit to identify what policies and programs have been implemented that might have the potential to address childhood overweight and obesity, but what are the gaps as well in a country that could potentially be filled? We, the tool then conducts interviews with a range of different stakeholders in a particular context to, to, try, to try and identify the key barriers and enablers to putting these sort of key policies in place. And then finally, the tool helps develop key recommendations for addressing overweight and obesity and also conduct validation workshop with stakeholders to try and ensure that the final, the final report, I suppose, is sort of an amalgamation of the perspectives from people from within the country rather than people looking outwards, people from out looking in. So we conducted this landscape analysis approach in five countries in South Asia, um, in India, Nepal, Bhutan, the Maldives and Sri Lanka. And from this slide here, there are really two key takeaways. First of all, as of this moment, overweight and obesity is at least 10 to, or around 10% in all of these countries, which is a course of concern, but it may not be as high. But what we're also viewing is that there's a really rapid increase in all countries in the region. And that's something that's particularly concerning, particularly when you consider that we know that underweight and micronutrient deficiencies is also a really key key health concern here. And so it's important to recognize that there's really this double burden that's taking place. And it's highly likely that what the presence of some of these unhealthy lifestyle habits, so both unhealthy dietary habits and then also insufficient physical activity is what's driving this rapid increase in overweight and obesity. Um, and we can see some similar, even though these five countries are very different with different contexts, we can see similar patterns emerging. So insufficient fruit and vegetable consumption, insufficient physical activity, but also quite a high fast food and sugar sweetened beverage consumption amongst other, um, other unhealthy um, products. But what the tool also identified is that overweight and obesity is not just a problem of individual choice and intend, instead it's unhealthy food environments that are almost certainly driving the rapidly increasing prevalence of overweight and obesity here. And when we talk about unhealthy food environments, we're talking about unhealthy environments where children live, study, play in, um, where unhealthy foods are more available, they're more promoted to them, and they're often more affordable as well. And as a result of this, what we need to address childhood overweight and obesity is not just small programs that focus on smaller populations, but instead whole of system and whole of population approaches and policy approaches specifically that aim to drastically change food environments to make healthier choices easier choices, both for our children and also for whole populations as well. At this point, I wanted to jump back a little bit to talk about the double burden of malnutrition in South Asia as well, because I'll highlight that the landscape analysis tool developed by UNICEF makes a special point to look at both undernutrition and overnutrition, because we know that they're intrinsically linked. Um, children of under five who are stunted are more likely to be overweight or obese later in life, and underweight and overweight mothers are more likely to give birth to children who are overweight or obese later in life. And indeed, across South Asia, we identified that underweight and undernutrition are consistently still a health concern. But we also really positively identified the number of programs and actions that might address undernutrition have been implemented. And when we talk about these programs, we're talking about um, programs to, to support breath, um, positive breastfeeding habits, ratification of the International Code on Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, programs for addressing maternal nutrition, as well as monitoring of underweight amongst children. And it's likely that these sort of programs and policies can also serve double duty for addressing both underweight and childhood overweight. But as Catherine mentioned before, there are also several key policies that are needed to address overweight and obesity in the country. And as Kath mentioned, these tend to be things like sugar sweetened beverage taxation, unhealthy food and beverage marketing restrictions, front of pack nutrition labeling, which is, we know is something that's on the policy agenda at the moment in India, um, and also policies to improve school food nutrition environments. 
And this includes both improving food environments, so making sure that unhealthy foods are restricted and unhealthy, unhealthy, unhealthy food marketing is restricted in schools, but also making sure that school meals and snacks are available, nutrition services like micronutrient supplementation is offered, as well as nutri um, nutrition education. And Catherine and I are both author of the opinion that it's really important to protect food and nutrition policies from potential conflicts of um, interest with the food and nutrition sector. So as part of this landscape analysis approach, we conducted a policy audit of um, food and nutrition policies that have been implemented in those five countries in South Asia. And we found that, A, there are some key gaps across these five countries, and also where policies have been implemented, they often don't align with what we align with what we consider to be international best practice. So just as some exclusive examples of this, um, we have television food marketing restrictions in Bhutan, they are um, currently under discussion in front of pack labeling in India and also sugary um, drinks taxes in Sri Lanka, all of which are really great to see, but there are also potential improvements that could be made as well. So to dig deeper into this, we conducted interviews with key informants in four countries, so Bhutan, Maldives and Nepal, and then we've got a dot, dot, dot there because the Sri Lanka interviews are incoming shortly. And we found that some of the key barriers to addressing childhood overweight included insufficient resources, particularly when it came to monitoring and enforcement of policies, a political focus on undernutrition rather than overnutrition, sometimes a lack of available data on school-aged children, particularly when it came to dietary consumption, and then finally, the influence of the food and beverage industry, which is something that's of real interest to my PhD, and I hope you'll indulge me because I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. And at this point, I'll point out that while my PhD is particularly focused on low middle income countries in East Asia, so countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Mongolia and the Philippines, the literature suggests that a lot of the findings that I'll speak about now are also applicable to low middle income countries globally, including we suspect in South Asia. And at this point, I'd like to introduce the concept of the commercial determinants of health which broadly speaking is what we consider to be the strategies and approaches that are used by unhealthy corporations to sell their products and subsequently, um, subsequently influence health. And one of my PhD um, papers sought to look at what Coca-Cola, as a case study for other transnational ultra-processed food and beverage corporations, is doing in East Asia to try and sell its unhealthy products. And we took a potentially somewhat simplistic view of the commercial determinants of health and saw, saw corporate activities as falling under four categorizations. Activities related to supply chains, which are these related to unhealthy food marketing, corporate social responsibility or public relations activities, and corporate lobbying. And first and foremost, one of the key takeaways that we found from this paper was that Coca-Cola and we suspect other ultra-processed food corporations are really interested in investing in lower middle income countries. And we saw this with the tobacco industry as well. When barriers to the sale of their products emerged in some high income countries, they pivoted and really focused on their marketing, their supply chain, their distribution efforts on lower middle income countries where, where um, regulatory barriers were slightly lower. We found that Coca-Cola is making big investments in bottling, bottling operations in low middle income countries, also in unhealthy beverage marketing, um, particularly using online social media um, methods to target children and adolescents. So we can see in that image up there, that's their um, President for Happiness campaign in the Philippines, where they sought to capitalize on a perception in the Philippines that happiness or contentment was a really key part of society. So they had a young ambassador for their brand make passionate messages to the community over the internet. And you can see behind them, there's numerous different Coca-Cola merchandise tools and banners. And then finally, also, they're really investing in corporate social responsibility initiatives, which are ostensibly to support things like education, and environmental cleanup programs, but really essentially ways to whitewash their reputation um, or rather clean their reputation, given the unhealthy nature of their products and often as ad hoc marketing tools as well. So that image down the bottom there is a little red schoolhouse, which is a corporate, um, a public relations activity of Coca-Cola in the Philippines, which are attention ostensibly they build schoolhouses for primary school students, but we can see they're all painted red and white, the colors of the Coca-Cola brand, and the loft had have Coca-Cola paraphernalia and banners hanging around as well. And then we also looked at um, industry marketing strategies as well and found that they're really interested in trying to prevent the emergence of policies that might prevent the sale of their products um, before they can even be implemented. 
And this is what another of my PhD papers was really interested. So I took a little bit of a deeper dive into the Philippines, conducted interviews with a number of key stakeholders there to discuss what their perceptions of, um, of unhealthy food and beverage industry activity was, especially when it comes to policy. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in depth. And this figure is somewhat academic, but essentially their activities come under, first and foremost, the messaging or the frames that their arguments take. And when we talk about these, they often argue or they argue that either a policy cost will be too high or that a policy benefits are um, overrepresented. So when we talk about a policy cost being too high, a classic argument that I know from speaking with Dr. Tiberia, that a classic argument you've seen here and we saw in the Philippines as well, is that um, policies will disproportionately harm low-income consumers. Um, additionally, a key argument that we saw in the Philippines, and I suspect we'd see elsewhere as well, is that under rather than overnutrition is a key health concern. And so, in fact, unhealthy industry products should be promoted rather than restricted because they're more likely to address undernutrition. And when it comes to policy denying policy benefits, in the Philippines, for example, they now have a tax on sweetened beverages. But a key argument um, from industry at the time was that sugar sweetened beverages don't actually contribute to obesity at all, at all and thus the policy was unnecessary. So we've spoken a little bit, and I'll jump back to those shortly, but we've spoken a little bit about corporate messaging. But the other, other, other aspect of corporate lobbying is how they communicate those messages both to the public and to policymakers as well. Um, and there are a number of different ways that they do this, and I'll try and talk through them briefly, but in depth. So first and foremost, there's this concept of coalition management. And that's where the food and beverage industry tries to form really powerful coalitions, both with other corporations, but also policymakers, key industry groups, and also the general population as well. So in the Philippines, they found that the food and beverage industry conducts extensive marketing campaigns because there's this perspective that policymakers are beholden to their voters. And if the voters support the food and beverage industry, then the food and beverage, then the policymakers are far more likely to support the food and beverage industry as well. Um, industry itself would also approach policymakers that might have the potential to be industry and recruit them to their side too. And this extends to what we call direct involvement or influence in policymaking. Um, and this is where industry might, form, through the formal lobbying process, attend consultation hearings where they'd sit with pro-industry policymakers, often passing them cue cards with messages that they should read at legislative hearings. But there's also informal lobbying as well, where industry might have private meetings with policymakers and also, in some cases, offer them financial incentives for supporting them and um, potentially also things like holidays if the uh, policymaker might enjoy going to the beach and things like that, which is in direct um, conflict with conflict of interest laws in the Philippines, but was reported to happen regardless. Information management is also another really interesting tactic that's used, and this is where industry will generate their own reports. So they might publish their own academic articles in journals which have really official sounding names and look really good, but they have no requirement for conflict of interest regulation. They might also recruit previous health workers to come work for them through what we call a revolving door method so that their messages are seen to come from health experts. Um, they might also occasionally threaten litigation. Um, so, for example, in the Philippines, they have a policy relating to the food and beverages that might be available in schools. And people involved in that policy said they were written to by the food and beverage industry saying that the food in the Department of Education has no right to control the foods that are available in schools. So, personally, I feel like potentially the Department of Education has one of the key rights for determining what food should be sold in schools, but that, maybe that's just me. And then finally, we also discussed why industry engages in all of these. And of course, the main aim at the end is to influence the implementation of these policies. And at this point, I wanted to point out that industry can potentially have a role to play in that process, but it's really when it comes to policy implementation. So when it comes to front of pack nutrition labeling, industry will, of course, be responsible for installing the labels on their products. However, when it comes to policy development, we feel that the safest way is to limit industry involvement because industry likes to do things like prevent policies from being implemented full stop. Um, they might try to delay policies. They might try to weaken them. So, for example, in the Philippines, I mentioned the sweetened beverage tax. The tax that was initially proposed was stronger in the terms of both the rate that it was initially was, but also the products that it targeted. And then through the process of consultation and industry um, criticism, it was watered down. And modeling that I conducted as part of my PhD suggests that the initially proposed policy would have resulted in significantly larger health benefits and also government revenue and healthcare cost savings as well. 
So what can we do about this? And I'll only touch on this briefly, but given that we know that industry uses similar arguments um, when it comes to all sorts of different policies, we can also have similar arguments to counter industry as well. And um, as I mentioned before, a key argument that industry likes to draw on is that food regulation will harm businesses and cost jobs. But this isn't actually the case at all. And we've um, found from case studies in both Chile and Mexico where they've implemented sugar sweetened beverage taxes that there's been no, no influence on employment following this at all. Likewise, industry often makes the argument that actually individuals should be responsible for their diets, not governments. Um, but this isn't the case either because at the end of the day, governments are paying a cost for overweight and obesity. In 2019, the economic impact of overweight and obesity globally was almost 30 billion, and this is only going to rise. So it actually government has a prerogative to act because it is taxpayer dollars that are being spent on addressing this health concern. And then finally, industry will often make the argument that they should in fact be part of the solution. And we disagree with this strongly because industry at the end of the day isn't beholden to the, beholden to the population, they're beholden to their shareholders. And indeed, they often have a legal responsibility to try and maximise shareholder value. And we can see taken from the Coca-Cola 2019 yearly report um, that Coca-Cola believes that corporates are vulnerable to more frequent regulatory interventions, such as taxes on sugar. And Coca-Cola Amatil continues to engage with stakeholders to raise awareness of the impacts of additional regulations and develop initiatives to achieve public policy objectives with minimal impact to consumers and the group. So as you can see, there's no real concern for health there, but instead for, the, um, for, their, manage for their managing boards and their shareholders. So I've spoken quite a little bit about food and beverage industry, and especially about food and beverage lobbying, food and beverage industry lobbying, but that's not the only way in which they influence food and nutrition environments. And another key activity that's conducted by them is food marketing. Um, but I'm not an expert on that. It said my PhD supervisor, Catherine, is, and so she's going to join you again now to chat more about that. Thank you so much. Um, um, so I'll spend the last part of the talk talking about food marketing. Um, and this is because... Uh, you know, certainly in Australia and many, many countries around the world, children are inundated with um, unhealthy food marketing and this shapes, you know, their social norms about what is a healthy or unhealthy food. So, you know, they wake up in bre at breakfast time, they might have some cereal with, um, you know, cartoons on it and unhealthy cereal, travel to school. Um, there might be food marketing on transport within school. Um, go to their sport ga sports game after school where certainly in Australia they might be wearing, you know, have McDonald's logos um, as part of the sponsorship arrangements. Go home, watch TV, read magazine, connect to social media, and they see more and more of this um, marketing. And there's really good evidence now that marketing exposure and the power of the marketing message um, across many different media and settings influences purchases. So older children are more likely to purchase unhealthy products. Younger children are more likely to request unhealthy products. And it creates this normalisation of foods, uh, unhealthy foods, leading to an increase in total energy intake and, um, you know, diet-related disease. And, and from a government perspective, all of this undermines go uh, government's legal obligations under the Convention of the Rights of the Child and to uphold the highest level of, of health. And I'm going to focus in on digital marketing for the rest of this presentation, and this is because this is really where industry is spending their marketing dollars so you can see this is a global food advertising spend on social media platforms. And remember that it doesn't cost much to market on social media platforms. So it, it increased between 2016 to 19. And then surprise, surprise, when we we're all locked down during COVID, there was a huge increase in the marketing of junk foods on, um, on uh, digital devices. And we know that digital marketing is much more impactful than traditional marketing. So you're marketing, you know, on billboards or um, around schools. And this is because marketing is a function of exposure, so how much you see and power, how engaging that marketing message is. And we know in the online environment, um, exposure is greater because people use um, online devices a lot for um, a couple of hours a day. Um, we know that marketing messages are virally spread through the internet. They're hyper-targeted, so through the collection of data, uh, marketing messages can be specific uh, to you. And then in terms of the power of that marketing message, there are also personalised messages, immersive content, and it's trusted content, whether it be peers or influencers. And I'll just go through these um, in a bit more detail. So hyper-targeting, this is a... Um, 
a case study um, that won an award for how good its marketing campaign was in Indonesia, where Milo, which is a beverage produced by Nestle, um, full of sugar, launched a geo-targeting mobile campaign to promote its drink drink as a healthy product uh, for families. And they use this hyper-targeting method by um, using a geographical targeting me method where as mums walked near a certain store, they got a notification on their phone and told them to come in, um, give a lot of data on them themselves and their family, and they'd receive a physical activity wristband. And what you can see really here, really clearly here, is that huge impact. So the campaign delivered 44 million impressions on mobile and 122% uplift in brand favorability. And you know, if you think this is one study um, in a, in uh, the UK actually, which said that by the time a child turns the age of 13, approximately 72 million data points have been collected on that child. So this is just one study, but they're all equally as stark if you look at the different studies. And that data that's been collected is then um, synthesised and commodified by selling it back to third parties so those third parties can market their products. Um, Personalisation is for a single marketing campaign, what you see and what I see could be completely different and that's algorithmically determined. So this is a Cadbury ad and you can see there's a number of different versions it's from Facebook where it says this ad uses one of our dynamic products where advertisers provide a combination of images, text and platform specific preferences so that our system can automatically create the right combination for the audience based on the data that's, that's available. We know the content's immersive, you know, these are some Snapchat lenses, um, but it's also shared through trusted content. And this is a study we looked at TikTok, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of, which is a video sharing platform. And we looked at the top um, the top 15 global food companies and how they were using TikTok. TikTok. And what, one of the things they do is they launch what's called a hashtag challenge where they um, get users to create their own videos using the brand um, of, of the challenge. And what was really striking is the huge reach. So as for a single hashtag challenge, over 100 billion views of the collective videos from that um, hashtag challenge was quite common. So huge amounts of reach online. And as um, TikTok says, um, you know, they're really turning users into unofficial brand ambassadors. So we did um, with, with UNICEF, we did a study where we interviewed or we uh, sent out a survey to the ministries of health across 24 lower middle income countries and we asked a series of questions around uh, food marketing and what came out really strong is that 92 percent of government representatives across these 24 countries highlighted that they want to do something about food marketing especially online but they have no idea how to go about that and so what we heard was government saying we don't know how to we don't know how to monitor the online marketing space. If you can't monitor it, you can't enforce a policy. If you can't enforce a policy, what's the point in regulating it? And so this is the last piece of work I'm going to talk about, and it's a it's a um, piece of work we've been working on at Deakin University for the last couple of years, and it's developing a deep learning system to detect and classify unhealthy food marketing. And so what we do is we're building our own big data, essentially. So we're collecting a huge number of um, images that relate to unhealthy food brands. We then annotate those. Um, we, have a, we have some algorithms that are trained against that data, and then we evaluate the model. So this is the, Im at the um, image annotation process um, where we have people sitting there. They're usually PhD students who want to um, take a break from their PhD, and they sit there and annotate these different images. And we're building, you know, hundreds of thousands of um, images in this library. Because we're building big data, we then augment the images. So we flip them, we invert them, we change the colour, we squish them, we cut them um, to build our data set even um, bigger. And we're really focusing on these transnational uh, corporations um, in the first instance on quick service restaurants or fast food, soft drink companies and confectionery companies. And then we train, we train our algorithms against our image library. So we're using a mass region-based convolutional neural network, which essentially um, is using an, an object detection mechanism where, um, based on our library, the algorithm is able to detect that logo in photo or video images. So this is um, our training and evaluation model where we have our data set, 
we augment our images, we, then we split the data set. We take 80% of the data set for training and 20% for validation. We train our model, we validate our model, and then we check the accuracy. If it's working well, we export the model. If it's not, we add more images, we tweak the data set, and we keep going. We do this every single, every, every week, um, and we've been doing it every week for about two years. Um, and this is an example of um, the, the system in action. So I've got up here... Um, you can see the mask over the Coca-Cola label or the mask over the Hungry Jack's label here with a black line through it. And what that is is, is the model picking up the image um, with a, and saying what, what the image is and then a probability of, um, of, whether, of what it's detected. So I'll just press play on here and you can see. Um, so this is just someone using a mobile phone. We're capturing the whole entire screen of the phone and you can see here the algorithms picking up these, um, these brands as it goes through. So it's an, this, this changes a study which traditionally would have taken a year or two to complete by someone sitting there manually watching all this footage after you've collected the data from participants into just a couple of, a couple of weeks to analyse the data. So it's addressing that hugely resource-intensive task. And the idea is to feed it into our policy um, so that if governments do put regulations in place to regulate junk food marketing, they've now got a system to be able to monitor and enforce that policy. And we're also developing a web-based um, interface where people can, uh, public people um, that we know in public health can log in, um, put their files there and, and have automated data visualisation outputs. And then we've just got a grant, a three-year grant where we're expanding this system. So we're scaling it up to more foods and beverages, but also out to um, e-cigarettes, tobacco, gambling um, and alcohol. And we're recruiting uh, three to 400 children and youth where we'll ask them to press a record, download an app, press record, where we'll, um, as they go about their daily digital lives, we'll capture the whole entire screen of their phone. That data will be sent to us through a web-based um, storage system. We'll run a face-blurring algorithm through it to uh, blur out third parties, and then we'll run it through our AI system to analyse that data. So that's um, currently underway. And then um, another piece of work that we've been doing is we're, we're capturing in the world um, from a child in the digital world, but we're also doing that in the physical world. So these are some glasses that we've developed. That's my son down there on a documentary in Australia, um, which was highlighting some of these, uh, you know, food environment challenges where um, the ch child puts the glasses on and walks um, and conducts, you know, a usual daily task. And we capture the world through the eyes of a child and we can see exactly what that child's looking at for how long. Um, and then we run that through our AI system to be able to analyse the data. So just to wrap up, um, we've shown that unhealthy diets and obesity are increasingly, um, are increasing rapidly across the globe. And, um, you know, we really need to do something about it or we're going to have these huge, uh, we're already starting to see these huge unsustainable um, healthcare costs. And, you know, the way we look at this is really around population prevention. How do we prevent obesity? How do we create enabling environments um, right across the population? Without doubt, corporate influence is a key barrier to action and um, we need to look at ways in which we can reduce the food and beverage industry that has a clear conflict of interest um, in this space. And, you know, I think we really need to look at innovative solutions to advance policy and practice. And, you know, with, with the rise of artificial intelligence, I think there's lots of um, options for us to come up with creative solutions as well. So thank you very much for, ha for having us. It's been a pleasure to be here. Any questions? I think I will start the barrage of questions if there are any. <laughs> I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, as you said, the industry always tries to postpone or delay or resist any regulation that uh, restricts advertising or marketing, including front of pack label or taxation or whatever. Uh, another argument that the industry often puts forth, especially in Southeast Asian countries where 
there are small players is that uh, once you introduce any of these regulations, uh, whether it is front of pack or whether it is uh, 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 taxation of foods, there are a lot of these small players. I mean, in a country like yours, you've perhaps targeted and researched and understood how the big players are doing. But in a country like ours, where there are small players, they say that you know these impact, uh, for instance, a small uh, savory or a salty uh, food manufacturer in, in India, maybe he or she is just meeting about 10 people's employment or something mm-hmm. like that, but has a substantial market for that. But their markets get uh, influenced or maybe uh, they get affected negatively. So did you come across any such scenario where the industry puts forth this argument? And if so, how it needs to be uh, confronted? Yeah, I mean, across the world, if you look at some of the big policies, so sugar sweetened beverage taxes or um, marketing controls, often small and medium enterprises are excluded from those policies. So, um, or it's phased in over time. So in the UK, the marketing restrictions, small and medium enterprises are excluded. In Chile, um, small and medium enterprises were expected to comply with the law after a certain amount of time, like two years. So it's phased in over time, um, starting with the big corporate players. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's a real um, issue and and that's why I think we need to think about not just single policies by themselves, but how do we, you know, because these, these are real issues. We want to, like, the livelihoods of people with these small um, businesses as well. So I think governments can intervene by looking at how they either phase in policy and then offer alternative supports as well. But I think those big policies... First and foremost, they are focused on these big transnational corporations and you might see them less in some of these South Asian countries, but as Ollie's work showed, they're starting to invest hugely in these lower middle-income countries. So it's starting to get, it's looking at how do we get on top of that earlier. Do you have anything to add? I'd add to the um, first part, that was absolutely something that came out from some of my work in the Philippines. Um, for example, with the suite, and that was, as I mentioned, coalition building where they identify other industry players that may not be direct beverage beverage manufacturers, but still contribute to the market. So in the case of the sweet and beverage tax in the Philippines, they um, they recruited sugar farmers and similar to that. So it's definitely a key, um, key argument they use. And in the Philippines, one of the counters to that was the tax has a differing rate for high fructose corn syrup and other sugar beverages to account for the sugar. And then that one subsequently industry argued against World Trade um, World Trade Organization requirements um, for that. But that was to account for the fact that sugar is produced in the Philippines, but also it's the high fructose corn syrup that was in a lot of their beverages too. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, one slide I, I like very much is uh, individual is very much responsible when compared to the government. That slide I like very much. Uh, my question is, uh, which communication strategy works better when uh, unhealthy diet, especially when uh, unhealthy diet is concerned, when the target when the target audience, if uh, like children are considered. I mean, the first thing I'd say to that is you can give all the education in the world, but if you send them back into an environment that doesn't promote healthy choices, then you'll only ever have so much impact. So I think education is incredibly important, but we need to address the environments that we send our children into as well. Um, In Australia, there has been some communication campaigns off the back of our anti-tobacco movement. Um, So we are very successful in Australia in terms of tobacco control um, and that shows really clearly that education and communication campaigns have been incredibly important, but only alongside advertising restrictions and pricing controls, so taxes and floor prices. Um, and a lot of those campaigns were really based around, and I'm not sure it's it's um, always translatable, but based around um, sort of fearful um campaigns around what the impacts of tobacco can actually have. And our Cancer Council in Australia has taken a similar approach to um, communicating the harmful effects of food. But I think you have to be a bit more careful in food around stigmatisation as well. So tobacco, it's a bit more black and white, it's good or it's bad. Whereas in food, you know, it's diets that we care about. And, you know, it's okay. You know, we had, we eat unhealthy food and, um um, I love what are they called the gulab in gulab jamun. Gu- yeah, they're delicious. <laughs> um, 
you know, it's not black or white. It's, you know, diet, whole diet. So I think we have to be a bit more careful to make sure we um, don't stigmatise foods as well. But that's certainly an approach with sugary drinks that's been applied, trying to put in, um, use these more scaremongering campaigns. But they didn't work during COVID. Our Australian government also tried it for COVID and there was a huge pushback saying this is not the right environment to use these more negative, you know, campaigns. Thank you. Yeah, I have a kind of philosophical question. This whole framework, uh, no, I fail to understand. The reason is that why you allow, uh, no, let me make it simple. Does industry regulate us or do we regulate industry? We means it could be government or individuals. That's a simple question. But if, if I have to elaborate, in the first place, why industry has to produce all these things? Or we allow them to produce and make taxations, ask them to put the print up labeling, back up labeling, mm -hmm. all these things. And then why industry has to produce and blame the individuals that you are responsible. This whole thing I fail to understand. Profits, because they make huge amounts of money. And I can just add to it, uh, food is uh, unlike uh, alcohol or mm -hmm. uh, tobacco, there is no yes or no for it. Food is an individual choice and food is a dynamic thing that, you know, your taste change the choices and that again depends on availability and that's where the market actually plays and then makes more and more new varieties available. I mean, in India, when we grew up, we didn't know anything about pizzas when we were young, very young. Yeah. Like, you know, by the time we were in college, I think India has liberalized and, you know, we got all these. But today's generation has started with all these right yeah. at the beginning. So that's how... Uh, and one, one last question, one thing that always bothers me is that there are these global players in um, food and uh, beverage manufacturing. Across the globe, you've seen different countries have different restrictions, like uh, there are warning labels in Chile or Mexico or Israel and other places. There are summary labels in some places. Uh, there are no labeling, front of pack labeling in countries like ours. There are taxes in some places. The same manufacturers when the government is uh, forcefully enforcing a particular regulation, comply with the regulation in one part of the globe, don't want to comply with mm -hmm. a similar regulation in another part of the globe. I understand it's it's for the profit, but you know what is employed or what is done elsewhere to uh, modify or reformulate their product? Why can't it be done in markets where there is no regulation? Why industry plays this? Do you mind? Yeah. I think um, a key argument or a key reason that industry does that is what they call a slippery slope of regulation. Um, so industry doesn't like to, and when we talk about industry, Kath and I, Kath and I are mostly are talking about really big companies. So we know that the informal sector is really big and is where a lot of food and beverages are purchased in South Asia. When we talk about especially lobbying, um, really the big transnational companies are some of the corporations that are engaging in that. And they don't like to see any food and nutrition policies implemented. And um, earlier today, Catherine made a great example with the tobacco, industry, the tobacco restrictions in Australia. And 40 years ago, it began with one policy and then five years later, another one, and then another one, and then another one, which is really good. And now we have very strong tobacco controls. Industry worries that if you put a front of pack, the Indus, um, India's health star um, rating system in, then that starts there. And then maybe a little bit later, you say, well, every product that has a one star rating has a tax of 10%. And also that product can't be marketed on the television between 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And so in any country, they'll fight to have prevent these policies being implemented because they fear that once one policy is implemented, there's regulatory appetite for more policies to be implemented. What did you call this? Slippery slope. Slippery slope. The slippery slope of regulation. Like a slide. <laughs> yeah. I mean, going back to the comment made before as well, uh, we always say that you, you, we can choose two worlds. We can choose one that... Um, enables healthy choices that we send our children out to and we go shopping with our children and it's easy to eat and buy healthy foods and or we can choose a world that's set up by an industry that makes huge amounts of money from us eating unhealthy foods so the regulation is really governments um you know correcting that market failure and correcting those food environments so that we can send our our kids out into a world you know, the kind of world we want to send them out into, really.
Yeah. See, uh, giving regular regulatory permissions, and later studying how much percentage prevalence of obesity and other things. Before, well, before that, government should take uh, proper stringent actions on this release into the product, into the market. It should not get influenced by the Western world or that world is world. And the first point. Second point is a lot of politics is involved in this. Mm. Two industries have been given permissions, few are not been given. And uh, when uh, institutes like us, uh, when you are finding out that one, again, that will go into the market. So government policy should be stringent before releasing any product into the market. That's I think that is the basic key point, uh, what I feel. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, I think it's hard, but um, that would be great if that was happening. Good evening. Thank you for this amazing, insightful lecture. I just had one question. I'm sorry uh, in advance for my limited knowledge. It's just uh, uh, towards the uh, end of the presentation, there were two models that you talked about. The first one was uh, like taking a lot of adolescents and capturing what all they are seeing on the digital devices. I just had one question. Like, uh, of course, that would give us a lot of. Uh, important information in terms of what all food environment they are being exposed to, what are images, what are videos are they seeing about food and unhealthy food environments. But wouldn't that also contain a lot of like uh, private sensitive information? How do we go about that? Yeah, um, so that's why, so you, you're absolutely right. So we um, collect this data under really strict ethical um, procedures. And so we have to use certain software that has certain privacy, um, you know, setups to make sure that no one else can access the data ever. Um, we are collecting data from third parties that have not consented. So that's why we run face blurring algorithms through that data. And then the third parties, that's why we use our artificial intelligence system. So we don't sit there watching the data at all. We run our AI system to extract the, the information about food advertising. And then that's the data we analyze. So we cut out all that background noise and we don't look at it. Um, and it's stored, you know, all the ethical procedures around stored and password protected computers and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very valid point. It's totally, you know, it's something we've spent a lot of time thinking what is the most ethical way to collect this data um, but, you know, we, we go through, you know, six to 12 months of ethical processes and then you've got big food industry that goes through zero, zero ethical processes and collects huge amounts of data from everyone here sitting in this room and uses it to, you know, to make you make unhealthy choices. And so, um, but yes, we do it in a very ethical way. <laughs> Thank you so much. More questions? I just have a same question in the continuation of the question. So do you uh, have any idea about uh, artificial intelligence based apps or uh, are you working on that or knowing the nutritional composition of what they are eating? That kind of um, we're not at the moment, um, uh, but I think there that, that certainly has been some studies using artificial intelligence to be able to detect foods within video or photographic images um, that can then co automatically code that information according to nutritional information. It's, it's, it is hard because, you know, photos of food online, and you don't know what the ingredients are really. Um, but there are, you know, certainly we've talked about it as an extension of our work. We've started on branding because 80% of food ads have some kind of branding within the ads. Um, but we have talked about once we start building our library around foods, what are all the different ways we might be able to use that for? And that could be um, where you collect data, you might have, you know, a data set that's this big, you run it through the algorithm and it extracts all the relevant information and then you might end up with a data set that big that you then go away and manually analyse yourself and you've lost, you know, the, that hugely time-consuming task of watching all that footage and, um, you know, even if you went out, let's say you went out on the streets of India and you took photos of as many food environments as you can or um, around neighbourhoods, um, you could then run that through the algorithm and really reduce your data set into the very, you know, data that you're specifically interested in. Yeah, but there is certainly some studies around that. Yeah.
And then I think you can also take it further to develop, um, you know, apps that, you know, whether it's around parental controls, um, you know, by parents downloading it and cutting out some of the advertising that's seen, you know, there might be um, some applications like that as well. We're not looking at that from, from that perspective, but we'll have the data and the capabilities to do something like that. Great apps that are black. Sorry? It is an episode in Black Mirror where the parent controls the blog, yes. yeah. everything I need to be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no questions, sir, I'm just uh, give my clue to Dr. Subara, sir, to facilitate our case to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Catherine and Aguilar for the talk. And uh, uh, our, our director could not be here for the talk, but she sent her good wishes and also some small take, take home kind of a memento from NIM, <laughs> which reflects the 100 years of glorious past of NIM. Uh, can I just have them? Uh, okay. For both of you. And then may I request Dr. Banu Prakash to please. Uh, Give them away. Come back. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll ask the secretaries of the journal club to please come and do the honor. <laughs> please come. Fine, fine. Come. Okay. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank uh, the secretaries of the Journal Club for taking up this out of turn uh, guest lecture. It's not a second or fourth Friday. And uh, and when they have done this uh, uh, quick arrangements for all this, it's a short notice. Thank you, both of uh, uh, you, Mahesh and uh, Anantan. And thanks all for being very good audience and then raising very good questions. And then I'm sure we have a lot to take home. And then Let's explore some collaborative work, all those who are working in the areas of overweight university. You're all welcome to Australia anytime. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to ask you, in tracking the journal sites, could you see?